This is Mike. Mike is a fully computer-generated digital human. He's an exact clone or a digital double of a real human. So let me introduce the real Mike. Mike is the result of an industry-wide collaboration of visual effects specialists, researchers, and artists that came together in the WikiHuman project to create an open and publicly available data set of a digital human. Digital humans like Mike are used in visual effects for films, in computer games, but also for robotics applications and even in medical applications. The human face is responsible for the expressions of feelings and emotions. And this is a key element in storytelling and communication. One can read so much from another human's face, and this is not different for a digital human. Among all the facial features, the human eye is probably the most important one. So if I hide Mike's eyes, you can see that his soul disappeared, even though I covered only a tiny area of the entire image. As a counterexample, I can move these areas to another region. And you see, Mike kept his soul. The challenge that we are facing can be explained with the uncanny valley. It explains how humans perceive a human face or a character in function of how human-like it is. Here we have a blob of color that barely resembles a human face. But the more human features I add to this face, the more familiar this face becomes. But this doesn't go on forever. At a certain point, we start to drop into the uncanny valley. In the uncanny valley, a face looks a bit creepy. Something is wrong. Often, we cannot even tell what it is. And in the worst case, it even has a repulsive effect something that we want to prevent under all circumstances. But if we do a good job, we might jump out of the uncanny valley and create a photorealistic representation of a human. This uncanny valley effect becomes even more pronounced if a human face is moving. The team at ETH Zurich and Disney Research that I'm working with has done an absolutely fantastic job at capturing the face of the human at an extreme high level of detail. And we can capture different facial expressions and mix and combine them together to create new ones. And we can even create animations of that actor. But again, this actor, this digital double, has no eyes. And without the eyes, he has no soul. So let's take a closer look at an eye to understand why it is so hard, why is it so complex. The central part of the eye is the iris. It has a lot of craters called crypts. At its center, there is the pupil, which is not pitch black, but it's rather a dark gray. Around the pupil is a ring muscle, which contracts the pupil, and which can be nicely seen in a blue iris. Then we have the transition from the white sclera to the colored iris, which can be short and sharp, or long and smooth. Then we have veins inside the sclera, which appear in different shades of red and blue, depending on how deep they are. We have glints and highlights, the eyelashes, and in the corner of the eye is the mysterious tear duct. What do you see here is one of our very first digital reconstruction of an eye. And as you can see, it's not a simple sphere. It's more complex. We need 10,000, even 100,000 individual points to model this very specific and individual shape. And we do this by capturing images, photographs. We do that 
with this system, which is basically just an advanced photo camera. This camera takes photographs from different poses of the eye, but also from different viewpoints. This might look super creepy to you, <laughs> but for me personally, I just love it. <laughs> so we can now take these images, which are just flat images. They have no depth. And since we have many, we can compute the exact shape of the eyeball. And the first revelation was that an eyeball is not symmetric. It is a bit rounder on the outside and flatter towards the nose. And if you look at the pair of eyeballs, you can see that there is a nice anti-symmetry between the left and the right eye. We can also look at the little detail of the eye. This is the eye of one of my coworkers, and he had a little defect, a little bump on one of his eyes. It's nothing dangerous, but we believe that these little details make an eye look real and not like a polished sphere of glass. We can also reconstruct the iris with all its crypts and craters, but this is not the initial result we got. After I wrote my first program and I was super excited to run it, instead of this, what I get is this. <laughs> a big disappointment. But it's beautiful. But that's the nice part about being a researcher. We discover and we learn. And on that particular day, I learned that there was a bug in my program. <laughs> if everything works as expected, we can reconstruct the shape and the deformation of the iris. And the color of the iris is coupled with the structure. A blue iris is really fibrous, and a brown iris is really smooth. But the biggest surprise was when we looked at the iris from the side, and we realized how much the iris moves to the front when it contracts. We can also visualize the iris in high quality, even at supernatural speeds. I showed you a system which takes a bunch of images and then computes a highly detailed model of an eye. But it's a bit tedious, and it needs a lot of time to process all these images. So we did a very neat thing that requires only a single image, but we get still similarly quality of results like these photographs that we downloaded from the internet, can be used to create a full 3D eye, which makes the eye creation process a breeze. We do this by capturing a big database of eyes of different colors and shapes, and then we use statistical and synthesis methods to pick bits and pieces from all these eyes to create a new one. And the system ended up having a bunch of sliders where we can change the size of the eyeball, we can change the color of the iris, or we can change vein properties like the thickness, the depth, and so on. And this allows us to estimate the slider positions from a few images, or even a single one, as you can see here. And since the model is still fully parametric, we can go in and change these parameters and make the veins grow in from the outside to the inside. Or we can create a more dramatic effect in a movie to create an angry character or maybe a sad character. And since the system is so robust, we can even fit these slider positions from a few images and paintings, like these classics from Van Gogh and Botticelli. And it even works with a photograph of a bird. So, this model helped us to create better and more realistic digital doubles, and this in less time. Maybe one day it will help us to jump over the uncanny valley. At least it helped Mike to gain a soul, and I hope many other digital humans will get one too. Thank you.